Hello, welcome back. This is Doc Garrett Lock. It's a short lift, no name more than a metre. And for a quick passage, you've got to get above this lock on your first day to make a two and a half day passage. The visitor's berth is the, the one we're just approaching. Now you can see the high, higher boat in the centre of the screen. And you'd be berthed there. Not in front of there, because that's a commercial vessel berth. And you'll see those later on in the video. And this white building here in this shot now is the shower and toilet block. We white cottages where the tortoises live. And that's looking down onto the visitors berth. We're walking along the lane here which runs alongside the canal. And we're very quickly you're coming towards the end of the residential berths at Dock Garrett. And here's Cascade waiting for the off. And this is Jacobite Princess, she's one of the commercial vessels that works on this section of the Caledonia Canal. Uh, she runs the eastern end of Loch Ness and runs down as far as the Tom Nahurik Swing Bridge. So be aware she's hanging around here. And that's us ready for the off. Uh, you've obviously noticed by now it's been a particularly windy trip so far and I'm not going to be disappointed shortly when I actually get into Loch Ness. The Dock Garrick Reach here is obviously the same height as Loch Ness and that's why I said earlier this is where you need to get to in order to make a fast passage if that's what you're looking for. I mean there's no reason to fly through the canal but some reason some people are pressed for time. But once you get into Loch Ness, you've got various options, so you don't have to do the whole of the lock in the one session. And as you come out of the dock at it reach heading to lock dock fur, you come past a big weir on your port hand side. This is the river Ness here you see, uh, which actually is the river that you see that flows down through Inverness. So this is your water supply. And uh, very popular with the salmon fishermen as you can see. There's a chap down there desperately trying to catch a salmon centre screen now. And, uh, we're not actually short of water at the moment so you shouldn't be struggling too much. And in front of us now is another one of the big commercial vessels that operates out of Dock Garrick. She doesn't go beyond Dock Garrick, so she goes Dock Garrick and then up into the, into the uh, eastern end of Loch Ness and uh, toodles around there and does the Urquhart Castle bit and what have you, then comes back and offloads. So all the passengers are all transshipped at Dock Garrick by coach there. And it's a pretty busy old boat, you'll get a hundred passengers at a time, no problem at all.
there she goes. That's Jack about Rebel. She's one of, I think there's four of them. They're all catamarans. Uh, they're operating on Loch Ness these days. Plus numerous ribs and uh, other smaller boats. And that's us looking back towards the weir and the dock Garrett Breach you see in there. And we're obviously going to leave these uh, green cans to port as we're passing along here. This is us in Loch Dock for proper now. And uh, if you look beyond the green can there and look up that wee little channel, you'll see there's a few boats in there. That's uh, one of Inverness's boat builders slant shipwrights, Robin. He's a good lad. And uh, he can fix more stuff than Robin. <laughs> this is coming to Loch Dock. For, it's actually quite a sheltered piece of water. And if you're coming from uh, west to east, and you've got the normal wind that runs down the lock, that's a good place to sort of get your sails down because you can come fairly uh, screaming down the lock at the last little bit, to say the least, if it's blowing pretty hard. And here we are leaving Lock Dock for now. You just see the old lighthouse, which I think has been converted to a holiday cottage these days. Uh, this is us coming into Loch Ness proper, and you can see the voyage as you come through. And uh, make sure you get yourself lined up well for the voyage because it is a bit, especially off the port hand there, it gets pretty shallow. It looks like it's stabbed, but it's actually port. And, and you can see it's uh, behaving itself as normal as the lock, and it's, uh, this end of the lock is a bit bumpy. But uh, we're cracking on. Well, it just continued to get bumpier, so we came back the next morning. And we're panning around now, and we're looking. This is the northern side of the lock you've seen. And as we come round now, you'll come round and you'll see the bay at Drumla Drocket, and Urquhart Castle is on the port side of that. We'll get a better shot of it in a minute. And that's us looking all the way up Loch Ness now towards Fort Augustus. And this is Drummond Rocket Bay here, and uh, if you're on a short passage, I recommend get above Dock Garrick, run up to here if it's windy, and then you'll get the sort of last of the wind and anchor where my finger just pointed to. That peninsula there just sticking out is Urquhart Castle there. Uh, a lot of people anchor straight at the castle. I would go further in because the swell can get you on the castle then. If you go right around the corner, it's normally nice and calm. And this is just typical of the lock. It's glassy calm this morning, and it was blowing 35, 40 knots last night, no problem at all. So it's uh, it goes up and down pretty quickly, and you'll see that there's no break in the film between here and Fort Augustus, and you'll see what the difference is at the other end of the lock when we get up to Fort Augustus.
and this is approaching uh, Port Augustus now and uh, the big vessel you can see coming down our port on side is another commercial vessel that operates the full length of the canal and it's actually the same width as the locks and length and everything so that's a lot of the glens and uh, he's a big old boat That's Fort Augustus ahead and a wee pan round behind us now and you'll see where we've come from and that's the Great Glen so you're looking all the way east down Loch Ness there and as you can see the wind's getting up again as normal Fort Augustus the approach a wee lighthouse is just off the starboard hand of the bow there that's what you want to be aiming for uh, you'll see the big monastery to the left of those trees it's just out of shot it's a fairly good indicator that you're on the right track. Uh, be advised as commercial vessels operate out of Fort Augustus and this is one just exiting now and I spotted him his top superstructure before I even seen the boat above the wall there. And here we are just approaching the uh, canal entrance proper now. And if you look through the starboard hand, that's actually the river, so you don't want to be going up there. And as you come in, you can look ahead. You can, so the first thing you'll see that's very obvious is the road bridge, and that's the year 82 again, the road that's going to haunt you for your whole journey. And the pontoons are all down the starboard hand. The pontoons on the port side are for commercial use only. So all yours are on the starboard hand here. Behind the commercial vessel on our starboard hand is the shower block for Fort Augustus. And have a little think before you get here about what you want to do. Do you want to stay here for a few hours and have a little wander around or do a bit of shopping? Or if you just want to crack on because the, the lock keeper is going to be on you as soon as you turn up and sort of say, what do you want to do now? So basically there's two lifts up in a day and two lifts coming down the way. And in terms of facilities here at Fort Augustus, uh, if you walk up to the road bridge and turn right, that'll take you to the garage there. And behind the garage is a little sort of mini supermarket. And a wee bit further on is a big car park with a rather excellent fish and chip shop in it. Uh, three or four pubs in Fort Augustus. I think the best one is the one if you go turn left, go over the bridge, it's directly on your right hand side now. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a good book. It's got a sailing ship and the window in glass.
and as I said, the uh, the lock keepers are pretty quick at gathering information about who is doing what and going where. There's one. That's the head rope, sir. Thank you. As normally happens, the lock keepers have a little discussion about the order of things and where they're going to go. And this Kess you've just seen coming down my port hand side now, he's quite a big lad and he's going to run in first. So once you start making your approach at Fort Augustus, the bridge keeper and the lock keepers are pretty keen to get you in because it's a busy piece of road here and it's, it very quickly clogs up the the town when the uh, when the road's closed because that bridge is open. So you'll get chivied along a bit to get in the lock. And this is us just passing the, uh, the main road bridge here, and uh, obviously once you're in the close it quickly behind you. That's us safety alongside in lock one, and uh, I'm actually off the boat at the moment, and then I, I kind of spotted that the guy in front of me was having some difficulties. So you'll see me leaping along the quayside directly in a moment. Basically, the chap on the bow, uh, kind of the boat got away from him. It was a, it's a big heavy thing. It'll be twenty odd tons, I think. And he just, he's quite an elderly chap, and he basically couldn't get the boat back in again. And uh, once that sluice gate water gets behind the bow, it's quite difficult to fight it back. So there's a lock keeper on the stern rope. He's pulling that in. And uh, between us, we got it sorted out. We can give the guy a hand. Again. Sorry.
standard form with all the multiple locks is effectively what you do is you you'll walk your boat up the locks because uh, obviously we're still climbing at the moment and uh, later on on Neptune's staircase you actually walk your boats down uh, it is quite easy you know it's not as hard as people make out it is uh, it's just pretty good form the skipper takes the sterner up so he pulls the weight and the uh, the lock keeper does the steering by pulling the bow back of the boat leave the ropes tidy for him and as you see we walk up and there's a slope there which is on the inside obviously of the safety barrier you're walking up so it's always a pretty good idea to have your life jacket on when you're doing the locks and you just snatch them on these hooks and that'll just slow your boat and stop it Fort Augustus is another place for tourists uh, obviously this is filmed early in the year it was April uh, and in the summer it is re really <laughs> you'll be trying to get around the tourists there will just be thousands of them literally thousands of them uh, everywhere you just have to be aware that they're uh, they're not used to having ropes thrown around them <laughs> And the siren you can hear there is just uh, a spin back round, and that's a, another big vessel coming into the locks. So we're now two locks up, so they're swinging the bridge for the bottom lock to get. I think it was a big fishery protection vessel coming through, and uh, there's normally one lock between us. So it's coming up the rope there for the lock keeper on the bow. And uh, the catch in front of us actually, just moments after this, uh, he managed to shoot his exhaust elbow. So he was manhauling without an engine after that. And uh, we managed to get some gear and we forged it back together. This is the top of the Fort Augustus flight now. And uh, this is the same evening. And this is me just leaving now to head up to go a little bit further on as you can see there's virtually nobody there what you find is that on an evening they'll either the top of the lock will either be very full or very empty and it depends on what day it is actually so if it's coming towards the end of the higher week for higher boats they'll have all gone because they've got to get back to their higher bases so the private yachts tend to go through in groups two three and four sort of thing you know there tends to be in a group unless you've got a rally on you know and occasionally you'll get these uh, scandinavian rallies where there'll be 10 20 big harbour grasses and naiads all together and uh, swans and what have you and uh, they're quite impressive and we're steaming away from fort augustus now we're heading up to uh, one of my favorite spots on the canal which is kytra uh, which is just a single lock that's going to lift us up yet again. Uh, the lock keeper, Linda, has been there forever. and uh, She's very keen on life jackets. If you wear a ja life jacket, you get a little gold star like being a good boy at school. I told an old age about Scottish weather many years ago that was if you don't like the weather just wait 20 minutes and you're rarely disappointed. As you can see it went from a nice evening to rain. This is us running up towards Kytra now. You can see the old lock keeper's house. That's the white building on the starboard hand there. Uh, 
it's not a holiday cottage, I think. In fact, the both are on both sides. I think nearly every lock keeper's cottage is now holiday cottages and a holiday canal system. This is Kytra. The place for peace and quiet. If you move on the downstream side, I this side of the lock, there's no electricity there. So if you don't, if you are desperate for electric, you, you're going to have to get here before closing time. Place to spend the night. In the next beautiful morning. Listen for the woodpecker.
We have an interesting moment just here with the uh, the hire boat. It's obviously, for whatever reason, hasn't actually seen me and decides he's going to come in the lock before I can get out of it. I don't think I'll fit down that gap on the other side. Basically, when it comes to the hire boats, just really, these people are on holiday. They've probably never driven a boat before, you know, and you've just got to be aware that strange things may happen. And this is us running into Kaloki Lock. And then after we come out of here, we're on to the uh, Avachalda Swing Bridge, and the weir to the side is into the River Oik. And the Abercheldorf Bridge, and obviously this is the 82 yet again, and uh, I tend to get a bit of a move on two of the bridges. It just lets them get the traffic moving again and maintains relations between boaters and locals. <laughs>
and this is us coming into Loch Oik proper now. And uh, it's quite a bit of voyage on Loch Oik. The channel's not uh, as big as it is in the other loch systems. The loch is essentially a flooded river riverbed. Uh, there's a few nice spots here. It's it's normally a lot greener than this. I'd say this is early. It's it's only early April, and uh, you've probably seen it pretty cool and nasty. There's got a bit of snow still on the mountain top, so it's uh, quite chilly. Hence, many big jump on every day. the narrows again at uh, on Loch Oik here and if, you, if you're wondering about the wind obviously the prevailing wind for this part of the world is southwesterly and that's the direction you're heading in so it's nearly always on your nose when you're going west so there's not a lot of sailing to be done a lot of motoring coming back is really good you tend to sail a lot of the way actually but not in the canal sections it's just too tight and we're looking towards there that's what's called the well of the seven heads which is a little shop and a cafe and uh, that yacht you can see moored up there has been there for about 15 years to my knowledge. There's a couple actually live on board. He's a boat builder. There is a moon at the Well of the Seven Heads. They've got a nice little shop there and do a lot of home baking. It's uh, it's quite a nice little spot actually to go into. And we're into some tricky voyage. There's a better shot of the Seven Heads there in the troll class I think it is. What they said. It's a wooden boat that quite tight here and you'll see just creeping at the picture there's a there's another a little yacht coming towards us here and uh, it looks like he's making a lemming type approach he isn't it's just that you'll see when we do the back shot how tight it is tight it is to go through that little bit of the channel there so I'm hard over and actually he is as well He's going through by outboard. And that kind of shows you how tight the channel is just there. This is just uh, running up to Lagan Bridge here. And, uh, actually, if you notice, you'll see me slow down a wee bit. I was going a bit too quick, and uh, had to put the brakes on. And once you're through Lagan Bridge, you're on a, a tree-lined section on both sides, which is really. Uh, quite nice on a windy day because it's really very very sheltered and uh, the trees literally grow right down to the water's edge And that's us through and clear of the Lagan Bridge. And 
and this is the tree line section here that runs you down to Lag and Locks, where we'll be finishing this number two of the series of three thumbs. And uh, Lag and Locks is quite a good spot if you spend the night if you're not in a hurry. It's got a quite different sort of a pub there, you'll see that in a minute. This is a burst in here on the starboard hand as you approach Lug and Locks. Uh, you can see it's completely empty. It's because it's early in the season. There's quite a few people sort of look at sort of semi-permanent type moorings in the summer here, and uh, so there's often a lot of boats tied up here. There's always space left for passing craft, as it were. I'm actually going to tie up here another a late and leisurely breakfast. I'll just throw it on the lock keep on the video. I can't remember if you can hear it or not. That is the Eagle, which is the unusual floating pub I was telling you about earlier. 